Thank you uh, to uh, Dr. Chakravarti for inviting us to this uh, intellectual uh, and emotional feast. Um, thank you, Liza. Thank you, everyone who uh, worked tirelessly to make this happen. Thank you, Ayana Thompson, for your vision, ACMRS for giving us a home. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this is my, uh, uh, this is the only unprepared remark I've got. Uh, but I do wish to express my profound uh, salamat uh, to the intellectual genealogy of black Canadians including uh, Afwa Cooper, uh, Catherine McKittrick, Dion Brandt, and Sonia Boone, and many others, whose capacious words energize and radicalize me every day. My talk is titled Genealogies of Movement and Border Crossing, the Case of Foreign Royal Women. History is boring, my preschooler complains when I explain the purpose of the family tree project his teacher assigned. My reverence for ancestral memory bores him. Genealogies confound him. They confound Juliet in her famous speech of teenage existential angst in Romeo and Juliet. Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself, though, not a Montague. What's Montague? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. As Juliet questions the biocentric markers of family histories, she reveals their centrality vis-a-vis -vis fantasies of pure aristocratic lineage. Witnessing, once again, the British media's racist dehumanization of Meghan Markle, we are reminded that her black embodiment challenges the racial categories of white royalty. Nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face nor any other part belonging to a man with a capital M, following Sylvia Winter, Western, heteropatriarchal, able-bodied, white. What tantalizes me about the Meghan Markle phenomenon, while I'm highly critical of celebrity cults and their embeddedness in capitalist accumulation logics, is that it blows the lid off Britain's profound investment in a white British past, present, and future. Her fraught black queenship provides a segue into a central driving force in my talk to read black presence in royal pageantry as an interruption in the narrative of white Britishness. One, black life and livingness. In the pathways of royal pageantry, black presence appears everywhere as metaphor, as performance, as lived life. Black presence challenges the genealogical fictions of clear lines of succession associated with royal marriage. Taking as my starting point Queen Anne of Denmark's royal entry into Edinburgh in 1590, I contemplate the presence and erasure of black life in official accounts of the festivities. From there, we will travel back in time to examine another Queen Anne. In poem on the water procession led by the citizens, I identify a similar teleology of black erasure and displacement woven into Anne Boleyn's royal entry to the city of London in 1533 while asserting that anti-black racism catalyzes the European imperial project, I read both pageants through the framework of black living and livingness, borrowing from Catherine McKittrick, in an intentional move, a reorientation to think discursively of blackness in the pre-modern past as vitality, 
as creativity and, invent as, uh, and as inventiveness. As foreign queens travel across borders, they are racialized by movement and geography, whereby their lineage and embodiment are inscribed into the ideology of the new masculinist patrilineal realm. Racing queens, I argue, and my emphasis on the active modality of the verb to race is deliberate signals a readjustment in conceptualizations of whiteness as an incorporative additive project of racial violence. My talk will turn towards two black figures, the unnamed black man in Anne of Denmark's court and Jack Francis, the salvage diver in Anne Boleyn's royal entry. Both figures appear in the royal marriage archives, its black lives, as highlighted by the great Imtiaz Habib. Close attention of the erasure, close attention to the erasure and commodification of black life enables a methodological opening. And this is uh, uh, what Dion Brand always asks us to notice, the openings, uh, that is two-pronged. It interrupts white genealogy as a temporal expansion of racial violence, and it treats blackness as, quote, rebellion and as invention. I'm going to quote Catherine McKittrick a lot today, and this is what, th these are the words of McKittrick. My talk concludes with an ontological call for the field of queenship and royalty studies to engage with the tenets of pre-modern critical race studies. By doing so, we can theorize the racialization of queenship through a framework that does not reproduce the narrative of difference, disavowal, and biocentricity at the heart of Eurocentric historiography and representation. Two, black life as metaphor. Queen Anne of Denmark's and James VI of Scotland's royal pageantry encapsulates the importance of blackness in the interconnection of race, gender, and movement. On the day of the Stuart marriage, the future king of England, um, I hope everyone is okay. On the day of the Stuart marriage, the future King of England requested a troop of entertainers that anecdotally included four black men. In his story, epitomizing the prevalence of black life as a signifier of material wealth and alterity in accounts of royal marriage and in scholarly criticism, the quartet danced in the snow naked as Anne's carriage processed through Oslo. They would later die of pneumonia. While the evidence of their life and death remains apocryphal, the, breast, the presence of diasporic black people as a racial fantasy in the afterlives of royal wedding celebration is telling. It is indicative of the function of prevalent anti-blackness in shaping the discourse of racial difference and white supremacy at the heart of royal pageantry. Put differently, black presence points to an inherent contradiction in white supremacist ideology vis-a-vis -vis blackness as central fantasy and state-sanctioned violence and erasure. Even though there's no historical evidence of this performance in accounts of the Scoto-Danish marriage, the recounting of this story as a story of black degradation and death is significant. Pre-modern royal pageantry encodes, inscribes even, the circulation, fetishization, and commodification of black life. The narrative sway and reach of black life as metaphor or as abstraction, or as conduit, or as repository of racial fantasies depend on the foreclosure of black humanity in royal pageant 
I think I, I think I uh, reread the, the same uh, paragraph twice. I'm very sorry. Uh, um, in royal pageantry and in scholarly analysis of royal pageantry. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, yeah, I was scrolling and I, I, I forgot to scroll. Uh, uh, this tells us something important. Black life relays a charged presence, breaching narratives of a foreign queen's royal progress. Black livingness sits uneasily side by side with the standardized monarchical rituals of power, listing of genealogies of noble lineage, mythical allusions to a Greco-Roman past, and rhetorical use of copia as a vision of natural abundance. Take, for example, eyewitness accounts of the wedding pageantry highlighting the presence of a black man leading Queen Anne of Denmark's procession. In Scottish records, he is described as a, quote, colorfully dressed black man holding a sword. In the Danish Chronicle, a hint of wonder and curiosity frames his presence. I quote, an absolutely real and native black man. Readers of Anne of Denmark's coronation, however, are quick to shift their focus towards the spectacle of black-faced performer, performers accompanying the royal coach. This attention is indeed warranted as the account is preoccupied to the point of obsession with what Ian Smith refers to as racial prosthetics. In the account, and I'm quoting, these people were masked with faces of lead, iron and copper, which were made so cleverly that it was not easy to tell that they were made of these materials. So natural were they. Some had blackened their faces so that their heads were just like those of black people. Their necks, arms, and hands were blackened, and around their necks they had beautiful gold chains." End quote. In this scrupulous inventory of blackness as artifice, impersonation, and performance, scholars read a prelude to Anne of Denmark's future investment in blackface, particularly in her commissioned 1605 Mask of Blackness. Blackface minstrelsy becomes a facet of a wider cultural process through which foreign queenship, queenship was blanched and incorporated into the king's body politic and or a repository for a foreign queen's gendered passivity or delayed agency. In these readings, the hypervisibility of blackness as artifice, performance, and the humanized curiosity is foregrounded as a conduit for the queen's power or lack thereof. And just a bracket that uh, our uh, uh, black uh, uh, um, feminist elders, Margot Hendricks, uh, Kim Hall, uh, Joyce MacDonald, have um, done the work of showing how uh, white womanhood is, 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 is complicit in this stratification of power and in, the, in encoding um, anti-blackness. Um, so the work is there, we just need to read it. My frustration with this approach is that it limits blackness to performance in the surface of white supremacy. And I'm grateful to Carol Mejia La Pearl for encouraging me to name and engage these frustrations. I was shy. Uh, so black studies invite us to go further, to read creatively and rebelliously the significance of absolute, real, and native blackness in royal nuptials. Embedded in royal pageantry, I argue, is what McKittrick theorizes as, quote, mnemonic black livingness that is unmeasured and unmeasurable. Building on Hortense Spiller's concept of mythical prepossession, whereby black life is conceived only through metaphor. McKittrick invites the anti-racist and anti-colonial reader to notice black life outside, quote, normatively negative concepts of blackness, end quote, beyond the burdened and burdening calculus of analogy, trope, template, or symbol. McKittrick's provocation 
to, quote, reckon with the materiality of metaphor and its underpinnings of racial violence resonates with what Michel Rolf Trujillo had theorized as, quote, the wider symbolic field, the savage slot in the transformation of white Christian Europe into the West, a structured ideology of colonial order, hierarchy, and fixity defined against the wayward other and deeply entangled with African enslavement and usurpation of indigenous land. But words, but words and worlds can be and can do otherwise. The epistemology of black studies as poesis, as aesthetic creativity, demands that we engage with black life in the European archive ethically, emotionally, creatively, politically, and personally. And Dr. Cooper yesterday really exemplified this kind of um, epistemology that does that. Um, in a royal Scottish court, a black person dons a livery of rich orange velvet, a taffeta doublet, and a yellow taffeta hat. He is most likely the attendant leading Anne of Denmark's procession through Edinburgh. As a page of the equerry, he rides with the queen everywhere she goes. He sits, he stands, he moves. These fragments are evidentiary traces of forced servitude or of the fictions of consent as Urvashi Chakravarti judiciously and brilliantly theorizes. Here is an instance where royal pageantry, especially performances associated with the foreign queen's border crossing and incorporation, deploys and erases blackness to assert racial hierarchy. To that end, we gather fragments of a life. In the royal wardrobe, and Scottish accounts, a black man serves the first table in the queen's master's household's hall and sits with the queen's four pages and her three lackeys. To that end, we gather fragments of a life. By his majesty's precept, deliver it to James English, Taylor, the furnishing following, to be habiliments or habillements to four pages of the Queen's Majesty and a black man. To that end, we gather fragments of a life. After bread, oil, there is the black man, the other before the Queen's met. One cannot reinvent the human without rebellious inventions, and rebellious inventions require reinvented lives. Catherine McKittrick again. This is from her article, Rebellion Invention Groove. In the generative realm of black poesis, where blackness is a creative possibility for both the black lives in the archives and for the critic interpreting them, the black man in Anne of Denmark's court is unstoppable, inconclusive, infinite. Three, black life displaced. Anne Boleyn's royal entry and coronation in 1533 memorialized in John Leland's poem on the water procession led by the citizens, where two instances are noteworthy. The comparison of Anne to Cleopatra, so glamorous in her Egyptian barge, and the image of a black person diving from the merchant ship on a loop. From top of the mast, a moor dived into the fast-flowing river several times. In a poem grappling with Anne Boleyn's new queenship after the upheaval of Henry VIII's protracted divorce of Catherine of Aragon and Chisholm with Rome, the two black figures are presented in motion. Even though their mobility is historically and spatially confounding, Anne's life at the French court marks her as strange and foreign born. Therefore, she is marked as other. I had stigmatized, but then your beautiful, beautiful etymology of the word made me um, quickly um, strike that. 
uh, as other early on in her queenship. Uh, because of time constriction, I will focus on the black diver only. Interjected into a profoundly allegorical tableau of royal pageantry is the physical, circuitous, recursive figure of the black man diving into the Thames. From the top of the mast, a black man dived into the fast-flowing river several times. Upon first glance, I connected the figure of the black diver to large-scale geopolitical shifts, whereby I read his presence as a bid for England to venture into the lucrative circuit of trade and traffic in enslaved people. Appearing on the merchant barge, his movement, mechanical and metronomic, a promise of the mercantilist dimensions of Henry VIII, um, a newly declared empire as it divests from papal jurisdiction, its boundaries poised for imperial expansion. This realm of England is an empire. Henry VIII had declared in the act of restraint of appeals a few weeks before Anne's coronation, where he collapsed the distinction between temporal and imperial dominion in a manner which extended the juridical rights of a sovereign prince. In this context, the black diver evoked one of the earliest genocidal and ecocidal ravages of racial capitalism. Bartolome de las Casas' account of enslaved black pearl divers who, it, who were trafficked to Spain's Caribbean oyster fishing settlements of the early 16th century. Yet such a reading would exemplify what McKittrick calls black livingness and ways of knowing weighed down by biocentrically induced accumulation by dispossession. These are McKittrick's words. The more I sat with the black diver, the more he burst out of the metaphor in a circular, never-ending loop of living outside white European time, beyond white European geography. His circular movement throws into high relief the fault lines in our, in my intellectual genealogies. Quote, the analytical work of capturing and the desire to capture something or someone, end quote, McKittrick again. His presence troubles our critical complicity, my critical complicity, in reproducing an ontology of subordination, of spiritual death attached to blackness. Against that end, we gather fragments of a life. Less than two decades later, the story of Jack Francis, the enslaved black diver from West Africa, illuminates the functionality of the black diver in Anne Boleyn's procession. Most likely a pearl diver from Guinea, Francis's enslaved body was used as a means to retrieve salvageable materials from the sunken St. Mary, St. Edward of Southampton and other ships. We know of Francis's story because he was deposed in a court of law when his enslaver was accused of stealing before the High Court of Admiralty in 1547. The terrible irony. Transcripts from the court records introduce him as, and I'm quoting the court records, Jack Francis, slave, as he asserted, of Peter Paolo, with whom he lived about two years, and before the island of Guinea, where he was born, aged 20 years or thereabouts, witness, as he says of his own free will, says through the interpretation of John Tyward, appointed and sworn as interpreter, that he had known the aforesaid Peter Paolo for two years, and he had known Domenico Erizo for about seven months, as he says, end quote. Stripped of his sovereignty, Jack Francis was still called upon to give credence to white jurisprudence as a witness in a lawsuit. By telling his story in a juridical forum, nevertheless, Francis narrates the world through an entirely unique and different set of phenomenological experiences as geography, as memory, as creativity, and as imagination. 
More urgently, the power of Francis's oral history is in the way in which it shifts our attention towards a non-white, non-European imaginary. That his testimony does not survive, does not preclude us, interpreters of the pre-modern past, to extricate this unmarked moment from the passivity imposed on its black subject, his longings and belongings. Rather, to breathe meaning into the instance of, of to breathe meaning into this instance of black life is to inhabit a radical epistemology of liberation that emerges from outside systems of capture, hoarding, and extraction. Most poignantly, unlike the fictional quartet of dancing black men in Anne of Denmark's royal entry, his afterlife can be otherwise. Conclusion. The radical epistemology of liberation and Ibn Sina's flying man. The gift of black studies is giving me the permission to revive dormant ontologies of beingness from Islamicat falsafa tradition. Like my child, I too thought my history was boring. Like Juliet, I too wished my name was not an Arab one. My arm, foot, hand, face belonging to man with a capital M. As part of the Lebanese national curriculum, I studied the Arabic philosophy of Ibn Sina as a high schooler. Nearly three decades later, I returned to the Arabic medieval tradition via the radical epistemologies of joy and liberation ensconced in black philosophy. I, le I learned from Fred Moten's black fugitivity, fugitivity Glissant's multiplicity in totality, Winter's politics of being as practice, McKittrick's black livingness, Gilroy's planetary humanism, Fanon trapped between nothingness and eternity. The list goes on. In closing, I wish to end with Ibn Sina's flying man theory as a mode of being that affirms black life outside paradigms of colonial capitalist world systems and modes of knowledge. Discussing the relationship between soul and body, Ibn Sina gives the following example. Suppose God created an adult human that is perfect in all their cognitive capacities. However, this person is created mid-air, floating or falling or flailing. He is blindfolded, there is nothing to touch, there is nothing to hear, not even the rustling of winds. With his limbs and fingers stretched out, the flying man is unaware of his own body. Predating this Descartes by 600 years, Ibn Sina makes the assertion that a person in this situation would be aware of their own existence, even though they had never had any sense of their material existence. I end with the flying man because its affirmation of beingness helps me grasp the suffocating limits of white epistemology which can only recognize blackness as erasure, comedy, or material extraction and existence. And a white epistemology which violently reinforces its claim to the past and how we interpret it. And more urgently, that white, epistemolo that white epistemology is not the only epistemology, and it behooves us to find more ethical and personal ways of engaging with black lives in the royal marriage archives. Ultimately, the flying man argument is a breach, an affirmation of existence, life, and genealogy outside white epistemologies, despite a hostile, violent world that tells black, indigenous, and other marginalized people otherwise. Thank you. I was to make, your, make sure you're all alert uh, for the beginning of our discussion. You're welcome. Uh, would anyone like to uh, talk about that paper with Mira, ask questions? 
as I tell my students, ask me anything. <laughs> Thank you so much, that was amazing. I just have so many thoughts going on right now, but I was thinking about Anne's entrance into Edinburgh, and I, I think the account says that the, the Moors were there to also facilitate some kind of crowd control, Yeah, which I thought was really interesting. It's like an emphasis on materiality and a denial at the same time seems to speak to what you're talking about. Yeah. I also remember the account saying that people were adopting different dance styles. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a bit about that. Like, was, and I'm not sure of the answer to this. Is that a style sort of gesturing to other uh, styles in different countries or? Yeah, well, I, I thank you for asking uh, this wonderful question, Amy. Um, uh, Yes, in the in the in, in the bigger part of uh, of uh, this uh, this essay, I talk about um, the forty or fifty uh, racial impersonators who um, were very much described um, very particularly. I remember the word "strange gate" uh, 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 that, and it was very exaggerated. Uh, their their uh, bodily movements, um, and I asked Tracy Hill uh, because uh, Tracy Hill uh, works uh, on royal entries and um, and on 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 civic entries. And Tracy said that this is the only time that she has seen uh, uh, that that kind of that that kind of uh, dance. Uh, I still have not theorized or, or or interpreted what it means. I'm sitting with it, but I also want to um, uh, think with Eliza O. Uh, who works on uh, racial impersonation, uh, on uh, dance, and how movement is very much constructed uh, uh, as doing a lot of um, um, racial uh, categorization. Um, it's, uh, thank you for asking me uh, this, but I, I, I agree with you. Thank you. Mira. Hi, Patricia. Hi. Um, so you know that we are supposed to talk about diving, and this isn't the occasion for an extended conversation, but I just was wondering what your thoughts are on the difference between the diver and that specific type of action versus some of the other types of movement that you describe in the other entries and in, uh, in this sort of like in the world of pageantry, because I, I too find that figure really fascinating. Um, I wonder about I wonder about the details that are omitted. Like, is it the same person diving over and over again? How much time is the elect? It must be so exhausting. It would yeah. be incredibly exhausting yeah. to climb to the top of a mass and dive off and then do it again. Yeah. Um, and then the the history that you give us about where that skill originates and for what it has been used and by whom yeah. is really fascinating to me. So I just would love to hear you talk more about how you came to that figure, why it was arresting for you. So I, I, I came to that figure uh, because I was reading, uh, uh, I am, uh, I'm writing an introduction to the Oxford World Series uh, on um, Anthony and Cleopatra. And uh, I was looking for Cleopatra in uh, descriptions uh, around uh, uh, queens. And Cleopatra surfaces in this, uh, in this royal entry alongside uh, Anne Boleyn. Uh, Sarah Crow uh, uh, wrote a wonderful, wonderful uh, essay about um, uh, the the work that that's that is doing um, in terms of presenting Anne as um, non-white or no, no, no. Uh, they, Sarah Crover does not use uh, 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 racial language, but as a cultural other. Uh, and uh, so this is where this is where I I 
I, I stumbled upon the Black Diver, and it fascinated me because uh, royal entry is when the queen very much physically, her movement is, is towards the king because the king was actually waiting for her. Uh, and it's kind of a very, very physical act of incorporation. She's moving, but as she's moving, she's kind of, her otherness is being re recorded, but also she's shedding it uh, because like a romance uh, narrative, uh, the end is always, always, the resolution is always, um, you know, again, what the, the, the magnificent uh, Urvashi, uh, Urvashi uh, uh, calls um, uh, wh wh white, uh, uh, white futurity. And um, I forgot the other term that I quote a lot, uh, Urvashi, and it's gonna come back. Uh, but this idea of the quest, the movement that always ends in a marriage that will propagate the, uh, the white aristocratic line genealogies. Uh, and what fascinated me is that um, the black diver was doing this, this, this work, this movement, but it's a movement that does not fit into that narrative of the, 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 the woman, the queen moving towards the king. And I did not, uh, after being so radicalized by uh, by the wisdom of Sylvia Winter and Glisson and Catherine McKittrick and Paul Gilroy, um, uh, I I I, um, I wanted very much to use their liberatory readings to kind of um, be. Uh, be able to kind of uh, to to narrate the movement outside of a capitalist framework that is going to inscribe him as you know this is what we're going to happen we're going to you know catch up and join the 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 central colonial project and you know spain is spain is ha has already uh, started it but we are following uh suit um it's a it's a very long digression, and I um, and it's it's about using the royal marriage archives to kind of marginalize uh, the the main actors uh, and allow. And I'm not. I, I'm. I, I'm. I'm trying to very much consciously avoid words like um, allow or discover or uh, uh, because these are very white supremacist terms, uh, and um, it's the possibility of existing with this not knowingness, with this uncontainability, uh, and and the movement that uh, the diver was doing is very much a movement that is um, not contributing. And I'm, I'm going again and again, and I'm thinking about uh, Kara uh, Keeling, uh, and I was telling John, uh, Jonathan uh, Shu about that earlier, but Kara Keeling, uh, I think in The Witch's Flight, uh, talks about how Fanon uh, has theorized waiting as a project of liberation. That what we, uh, this, this kind of atemporality that happens with waiting. And even though uh, my first impulse was to read The Diver because I've been conditioned to read black movement in that uh, very commodified way, the conflation of the, 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 the person and the body and the land and the money. Um, and then how black, study, black studies allowed me to just sit, uh, 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 sit, uh, sit, sit with this movement and not kind of impose a, a framework on it. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm rambling because it, you know, it's, uh, uh, I told you about this before, I'm fascinated and, I, um, I, and I, I thank you for this question and for allowing me to talk more.
Same, also fascinated, and I'm, I'm so appreciative of you giving us a different way to read this figure who I've also seen appear in the archives and not known how to engage with. Really appreciate it, thank you. I really loved your talk and just the way you think through these materials. And as you were talking, it got me thinking about the culture of royal pageantry in the Iberian context, which yeah. is what I'm more familiar with, yeah. and the context of the Iberian world. And it just made me wonder if you had any thoughts about the many audiences for whom these pageants are intended beyond the ones that are assembled in the moment. Because it occurs to me, especially given the conversation that you were just having, that these might also function as forms of trans-imperial discourse. And I would just be curious to know yeah. what, you, what you think of that. And I mean, it, it suggests these really interesting possibilities for thinking about the British Empire and yeah. in more direct conversation with the Spanish Empire by way of black yeah. pageantry and Yeah, yeah, completely. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pageantry that is mounted by the city. Uh, in honor of the king, but the, usually the agenda of the city is the one that's motivating it. Uh, and uh, and uh, usually there's also um, uh, a kind of guilds. The guilds are the ones that also put on shows through that progress. And you know, we, there, um, in, uh, in different uh, uh, progresses, there is like a Dutch uh, uh, interlude or a Spanish interlude where merchants representing uh, 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 th this, this, this trade uh, kind of create their own, also their, uh, uh, their own, they, they um, in, a, in theater. It's a very theatrical uh, way of uh, pr uh, 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 forwarding uh, their ideologies and what they want the city to do, uh, you know, with uh, trading with Spain or trading with the, with, uh, with the, uh, 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 the Hague. Um, uh, there's also the class system because this is the moment where the court, the, this, this aristocracy kind of uh, meets uh, the, the populace and uh, what Amy uh, referred to, uh, the, uh, impersonal blackness was used as a, cor a cordon sanitaire to uh, separate the queen uh, from, uh, the, uh, from the masses. Um, so there's definitely a class component uh, uh, at play in, in these uh, uh, productions. And um, they, are, they are completely uh, engaging in kind of geopolitical uh, uh, politics. Uh, to give you an example from the Iberian Peninsula, because when Catherine of Braganza in 1662 comes to England, uh, the, the royal entry is very much about trade with Portugal and this alliance with Portugal away from Spain as a way to kind of um, one-up Spain. Uh, so there's a lot of geopolitical uh, uh, agendas uh, happening uh, that all kind of are ch channeled through this progress of, uh, of the queen that is kind of straddle straddling these two uh, the, these two identities, but, but always, always getting incorporated and absorbed by the English king. You know, this is always key that, you know, no, no matter what, you know, what racial mar markers, what, what non-white, not non-whiteness, English seed is going to absorb it because we have a good, powerful king. Wonderful, thank you. Hello, Mira. Um, Hi, Miles. Your, your last remark is right on the question that I, I wanted to ask you. Um, I, I sometimes find myself wanting uh, when, when we talk about whiteness in this period, I sometimes want um, a kind of distinction and specificity. Are we talking about whiteness as kind of a pan-European 
phenomenon. And I feel like what you're getting at with these European queens is that, uh, and I, I guess this is my question, to what extent does a pan-European understanding of whiteness exist, um, or is, is race still national, you know, in, in some kinds of ways? Yeah. Um, and, and as one third layer, and I won't add it any more, yeah. um, there does seem to be an understanding of race as shared blood. You know, you are marriageable because of your aristocratic rank. Yeah. So it seems like those three are, are in some sort of tension, you know, a pan-European whiteness, a national yeah. um, kind of, of uh, a community, um, a, 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 a national natal community, being born here. Yeah. And then also, um, I forget which other two I said, but <laughs> pan-European, yeah. um, you know, royal blood and, and community of birth all seem to be different potentially racial systems, yeah. would you call them all yeah. racial? Yeah, yeah. Um, that are, 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 are being brought um, into mm -hmm. some kind of conflict um, in these moments, and I just wanted yeah. to, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, completely, completely. Uh, uh, what, uh, whiteness was not uniform. It was uh, uh, very much um, a, a moving target, mm. uh, and uh, Francesca Royster is, uh, brilliant, brilliant article on white limed uh, walls and Titans Adronicus really, really kind of gives us the cultural grammar and the racial grammar to talk about whiteness, you know, how Tamara, queen of the goth, her whiteness is racialized as other. Um, I also uh, very much love um, Noemi and the eyes um, own uh, theorization of the development of whiteness as a pan-European, uh, 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 and, and I'm using this your language and uh, not uh, Noemi, but more in the Restoration period and and on, on uh, and onwards, when wh whiteness is always deployed uh, uh, as um, a leverage against anti-blackness. Uh, so. Um, um, yeah, there, there's even though there are national um, uh, enmities, uh, all this dissolve when you know for the purpose of anti-blackness. That is always, always motivating um, um, that 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 work uh, and 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 also the incorporation of royal marriage because royal marriage is all about how how black how much are we going to like how close are we for uh, racial uh, impurity how close uh, that person we are uh, uh, incorporating into that pure lineage is. Uh, how close they are to, to blackness, to Islam, uh, for example, like in the case of um, Iberia. Uh, 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 so it's all um, the, the, the biggest danger and the biggest technology of racial categorization is fending off blackness. Um, and it very much surfaces in, in, in those. Despite, you know, uh, for example, in Anne of Denmark's uh, royal entry, uh, in the description, they, um, in 1603, when they enter into uh, London, the royal entry, when James VI becomes the James I of, um, uh, of, uh, of England, uh, as the, uh, the, the successor of Elizabeth I. And in that royal entry, they kind of make fun of the Danes. Uh, they, they say that there was like a, um, a Danish interlude by the, some Danish people, and they had like these strange movements, and they, ha like, they said strange things. But don't, don't worry, because, you know, James I already like ha did not see that, so... You know, who cares if the, if the king did not even bother to see that? So even though, you know, uh, and, and, and people read it as they're making, they, uh, they are uh, this, this kind of mode to make fun of the Danes is national, but also a suspicion that Anne of Denmark is, has converted to Catholicism. Uh, but 
I don't think so. I think it's a very much a, a kind of racial uh, uh, racial differentiation, a, a kind of um, uh, racial c codification of uh, they are uh, they, you know uh, as as some somatic whiteness, not not kind of the center of that construction at all. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful question. So I think that is our time, is that right? Um, so please uh, join me in thanking Professor um, Asal Kavantar. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Amir. Thank you so much.